They call me deranged. The hope is that they are right. It is of no greater or lesser import for another fool to wander the earth. But if I am right and science is wrong, then may the Lord God have mercy on mankind. These are the words of Victor Schauberger, a man born over 100 years ago into his role as a guardian of the earth. Among the magnificent Austrian forests, he grew up wanting only to become a forest warden like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and his father before him. But life was to take Victor far from the peace and solitude of great mountains and forests. Instead, he was to lead the struggle to preserve the earth, the forests and rivers, attacking the exploitation of nature as early as the 1920s. Nature was his teacher. Through an understanding of nature's principles, seen in the flowing motion of water, he gave the world a vision of how technology could be transformed to render free, non-polluting energy for our use. He warned of the consequences facing humanity if the present death-oriented technology continues. He died, betrayed by the same powers who promised to make his dreams a reality. Commercial gangsters who take all and give nothing back to the world. dies and with it a whole people perishes, not a finger is lifted. It is known that for the death of a people, the death of a forest has preceded it. All across our planet, the forests are being destroyed at a frightening rate. From the Amazon to Sumatra, from Siberia to Australia, from Alaska to California, the great virgin forests are rapidly vanishing victims of logging, acid rain, and drought. Only 50 years ago, this part of California was a vast primeval redwood forest, truly paradise on earth. Today, less than 4% remains, and every day, more of these ancient giants are felled. Even our national parks are dying of atmospheric pollution. Soon, nothing of nature's beauty will remain for our children. It was in such a paradise that Victor Schauberger spent his childhood at home in the forest. Even the family motto, faithful to the silent forests, echoed the deep respect the forest wardens once held for the trees. From an early age, he was a keen and astute observer of nature. He learned directly from nature, closely studying the relationship between the earth, the trees, and water. But water, the lifeblood of the earth, became his consuming passion, and he set out to discover its laws and character, to learn the secrets of its power. Far from being merely an inorganic substance, Victor perceived water to be alive and with its own cycle of birth and transformation into higher forms of energy. He spent hours studying the flow of the natural waterways, how water moves in characteristic patterns, how water currents become stronger in the early hours of the morning when it is coolest, and particularly during full moon. He recalled the stories passed on from his ancestors who utilized their knowledge of water to transport logs down from the high forested mountains. They built constructions down the mountainsides which made the water flow in serpent-like spirals. I knew that my father transported hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of beechwood over long distances, never, however, during the day, but at nights and generally when the moon shone. The reason for doing it this way as my father often explained, was because water exposed to the sun's rays is tired and lazy 
and therefore curls up and sleeps. At night, however, and especially in moonlight, the water becomes fresh and lively and is able to support the logs of beech and silver fir, which are in fact heavier than water. By the end of the First World War, Victor became the wildmeister for a large wilderness area of almost untouched forest. But his employer, an Austrian prince, had problems. He needed money. He needed a way to transport timber down from the remote forest lands. It was Victor who solved the problem of transportation, building water chutes or flumes based on his own observations of water flow and the knowledge of his ancestors. Through observing the movement of a water snake undulating through the dam beside him came the key to his success with the flumes. By imitating its movements, a combination of horizontal and vertical curves, the water chutes carried the heavy logs effortlessly. A patent for the artificial channel for transporting logs was granted in 1931. It enables heavy logs to slide through specially designed double concave channels without becoming jammed. Experts came from all over Europe to study the constructions and Victor was offered a position with the government. Ironically, it was the success of Victor's invention that opened up the previously inaccessible high mountain forests to commercial exploitation. He was forced to witness the brutal damage inflicted on the land he loved by short-sighted greed. He had observed how the streams reacted when the trees were cut down. When a mountain spring is deprived of its natural protective shade and exposed to direct sunlight, it dries up and does not begin to flow again until the shade is restored. Some mountain springs disappear, never to return. It is a fact that our supply of mountain water is shrinking as the protective forests are being thinned and cut down. When the mountain slopes are bare, rivers turn into thin trickles or dry up completely. Or when it rains, they become raging torrents, bringing floods and devastation. The waterways become blocked with silt and debris, destroying the vitality of the water and choking the lifeblood of the earth. Combined with the damming and regulation of rivers, this begins the vicious cycle of drought and flood. Here's some soil from the forest floor, still underneath the trees. Very humus rich, it's a very alive soil. The type that can still sustain life. Here's soil that's left over from logging and general human habitation in the forest area here. You see it's very hard and stony. Nothing really grows in it here, uh, except maybe some bracken ferns and what have you, um, maybe some desert plants. So you, what you see here is the actual changeover from the rich life of the forest to the desert that the people have brought to their activities. Victor fought for years against unnatural methods of water regulation. Another patent, granted to him in 1929, was a construct for creating wild brooks and flow regulation. On the outside curve of the stream, concrete triangular structures are wedged into the soil to direct the water flow into the middle of the stream. Stones are placed on the opposite shore to protect it from erosion. Some of these ideas are now being used to try and save rivers and streams damaged by the effects of heavy logging. But back in the early 1920s, Victor's warnings fell on deaf ears. The large timber companies that sprang up everywhere with encouragement from the state had only one goal, the same goal they have today, to transform trees into money as quickly as possible. Angry and disillusioned, Victor resigned from his position 
and turned away to continue his explorations of the mysteries of water alone. Far back in history, there is evidence that men who have attempted to solve the riddle of water have been bitterly attacked. If the riddle surrounding the origins of water were solved, it would be possible to make as much pure water available as required in any location. In this way, vast areas of desert would become fertile. The concept of unrestricted production and cheap machine power is so revolutionary that the way of life all over the world would experience a change. As Victor carefully watched the flowing of water, the infinite patterns formed by its streaming, he became more and more aware of the significance of the vortex as nature's motion towards growth and life. The vortex, or spiral, is the underlying pattern which permeates our universe, a pattern formed by two opposing forces which is made visible in the substance of water. All life moves between two polarities. Without opposite poles, there can be no attraction and no repulsion. Without attraction and repulsion, there can be no movement. And without movement, no life. All that lives moves between an upward spiral toward growth and purification, or downwards through deterioration and degeneration towards death. But within nature, both forces always work in cooperation with each other. The form of motion which creates, develops, purifies, and grows is the harmonious hyperbolic spiral, the geometric spiral, which is the pattern of the galaxies in space, the basis of all planetary movement, the pattern underlying all forms of life the natural flow of water, of blood and sap. In nature, we always find an open system, never a return to the same condition, as the spiral clearly shows. The purifying power of the vortex revealed itself to Victor while sitting beside an Austrian lake on a hot summer day. Suddenly, he noticed with surprise that the water of the lake was beginning to move in peculiar spiral.